women have come back from Iraq war with amputation. Beyond that, millions of Americans suffer from amputation. Worldwide, worldwide thousands of people every year suffer from amputation. My name is Sona Dwighty. I'm the project manager. Here's my team, me, Tony, Joao. We want to thank our advisor, Dr. Frank Razio. Also, we want to thank uh, Dr. Pixoyo, Dr. Siktar, Dr. Nordstrom, Dr. Tran, and especially Professor Flag to help us prepare for this presentation. So what is the current state of technology that's being used for the amputees, to help amputees? It's the use of uh, myoelectric arms, arms. What's the problem with that? The myoelectric arms uses the residual, the remaining muscles from the patient to operate, the pro to operate prosthetics. This is not natural. This, is, this doesn't come intuitive to the patient. Why is that? Because you have to learn. It takes so much time and effort for the patient to learn how to use the arm that uses that kind of signal from muscle. Also, the, it's not natural and it takes so much time. So what do we propose? Let me give you an example. For example, if I have this bottle of water that I don't know. Um, if I have this bottle of water, if I want to proceed to do something with it, if I want to proceed to pick this object up, the first intuitive thing that comes to me is to look at it. So imagine if we could drive that eye gaze, that idea of looking at something and make a robotic arm that works with the eye gaze. That's the essence of our project. So the question is, how do we capture that eye gaze? Maybe it's going to answer that question. Well, the way that we can capture a person's eye gaze is by using a bubble potential that generated right from our eyes or electro-optilogram, also known as EOG for short. To, to understand what EOG signal is, we first have to understand the physiology of the human's eye. So in our eyes, we have a cornea, which is located in the front of the eyes, and the retina, which is in the back of the eyes. The cornea is positively charged, while the retina is negatively charged. There's also a current in the eyes that flows from positive to negative that produces an electrical dipole that have a potential difference that can be measured. <coughs> this measurement is essentially what EOG signal is. So how do we capture this EOG signal? Well, the best way to do it is by using, by attaching electro to the, the surface of the user. And in a project, we use a biopotential acquisition device called the bioradio. In the project, we utilize two channels of the bioradio. One channel is correct, responsible for the vertical movement of the eyes, and the other channel is responsible for the horizontal movement. If you look at the picture over here, the red electro are placed above and below the eyes which measure the vertical movement, and the yellow electro are placed on both sides of the eyes that measure the horizontal movement. We also have another electro that serve as a reference point, the grounding point. So the bioradio get EOG signal from our eyes, it will then amplify it, then convert it into digital signal at a sampling rate of 256 hertz, and at a 16-bit resolution, this 16-bit sample will be then convert into a floating point number that we can use an uh, input for project. So on this next slide, we see what EOG signal looks like. So as the user change direction in their eyes, the, electro, uh, the electrical dipole also change, and which change the amplitude of the EOG signal. If you look at the vertical channel, when the user look up, the amplitude increase, and when, when the user look down, the amplitude decrease. Similarly, on the horizontal channel, when you zoom, when the user look to the right, the amplitude increase. When the user look to the left, the amplitude decrease. Also, you notice at this part right here, we have some spike signal. This is caused when the user are blinking, and this affects the vertical channel of EOG signal. From our good research and experiment, we conclude that the bandwidth of EOG signal range from 10 to 25 hertz, and the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, as in when the user look all the way to the left to all the way to the right, or from all the way left to down, it ranges around 1.3 millivolt, and which is correlated to the eye rotation of from negative 30 to positive 30 degrees. The last thing that I need to mention is EOG drift, which is a big drawback of EOG signal. EOG drift is a slow DC signal that exists in EOG, in EOG that 
will change, will change the amplitude of the signal slightly over time. This might affect the performance of project, but in a project, we have come up with a way to compensate this problem. So now that you know what EOG signal is, it's the main driving force of project, and Tony will tell you how we assemble and demo together. All right, so uh, as Min just mentioned, EOG is one of the main driving forces of our project. We also have uh, four components total, three other components which we'll describe in the upcoming slides. So for the head tracker, shown there, um, the, uh, we use that to keep track of the head and orientation and position of the, uh, of the head. The reason behind this implementation is that your head will not always be fixed in a straight position. So um, if it is, and I just move my eyes in random locations, then the EOG can accurately track uh, eye movement to some extent. The minute your head shifts one way or another or disorients itself is the minute that the EOG will, uh, won't be the only um, accurate factor. It needs something else to, uh, to make it accurate. So we implement a head tracker unit, all it is an infrared camera um, mounted uh, in a stationary position, as well as a reflective clip that can uh, reflect the infrared signals back into the camera. Now the, uh, the reflective clip is mounted to an everyday hat, so you won't look funny wearing it. Um, and with that, even if your uh, head moves out of position, uh, it'll still, the system will still keep track of where your eyes are pointed, whether your head moves or not. So with head tracking, with, uh, with EOG sensing, we have enough uh, information to drive our robotic arm. All right, with two of these components, the EOG sensor and the head tracker working together, we can track exactly where the eyes are looking. So the question is, once we have those two pieces of data, how are we going to integrate those together to actually control a robotic arm? Now, our objective was to get the robot arm to just point where the user is looking. And that's how we tested our system. So to do that, we map different joints on our robot arm to different movements of the head and the eyes. So for instance, joint zero right here. As the user moves his or her head to the left, joint zero moves to the left. Likewise, <coughs> as the user moves his head to the right, joint zero moves to the right. So the whole robot rotates. The horizontal component of the eyes is corresponds to joint two right here. So as the user looks to the left, joint two rotates and just the whole robot points to the left. Same thing for the right direction as you look right. Joint three corresponds to the vertical component of both the eye gaze and the head move. So we had to combine those together. So what we did, was we took the angle of the eyes and the angle of the head and added them together. So the way that works is if you're looking straight forward and your eyes are looking straight forward, both of those values are zero, both of those angles are zero. If your head moves up, that's a positive angle, and if your eyes move up, that's a positive angle, or if you look down, it's a negative angle for both of those. When you add them together, for instance, if you're looking straight ahead and you tilt your head back, your eyes are producing a negative angle, your eyes are actually looking down, and your head is looking up. Those cancel out, and so the robot keeps on pointing straight forward. The way we integrate all these things together is with the personal computer, the desktop. The way that works is we have USB <laughs> connections from all three of these external components. What happens is that there is Windows XP running on this computer and three separate programs, each one corresponding to one of these external elements. The two input elements, the EMG sensor and the head tracker, they use both write data, the programs that correspond to those two elements, write data to data files that are then read by the program that um, reads those data files and operates the robotic arm. And this is what I would say. Here we have a basic demonstration of the EMG and head tracker system. Here we have the user connected to the bio radio as well as using the um, head tracker unit, which is an infrared camera right here. And here we have the robotic arm. So as a basic demonstration, I'm going to ask the user to look left, look center, look right, look center. Move your head right. Move your head left, move your head center, look up, look center, move your head up, move your head center. This is a screenshot of a computer that's processing all this information, running all three of those programs. So that was just a basic demonstration. What we're going to do next is show you uh, our actual testing process where we try and hit targets by looking at them. And this is that test. What we have right here is a webcam who's recording the user's face as they move around. And if you look carefully, you can see that as the targets change, which is randomly generated, the user's eye, the user's eyes looks at them and the robot arm corresponds relatively quickly. Um, the head tracker is this device right here, and it's, uh, it's tracking these, uh, the clip right here. The user's not moving his head very much in this particular clip, but even my new changes are being accurately tracked and compensated for um, in this setup. And as you can see, it's um, a reasonably accurate system where we can actually hit these targets as they change. Yeah. 
So as the video demonstrated, we implemented what you call a center out approach. Basically, we have a center circle where the arm is pointed straight, and whenever a randomized green circle lights up around it, the robot arm will be required to move from the middle circle to that corresponding circle. Now we're interested in two things. One, how long it takes to move from the middle circle to that green circle, how long that takes. We call it T1 or the landing time. Uh, and T2, how long it takes to stay within that uh, uh, required circle. We call that T2, it's a precision time. So we have uh, certain requirements. The uh, landing time from point A to point B has to be within 10 seconds um, of, of travel. And also the T2 precision time, how long it stays in there, has to be greater than two seconds. So if both of these requirements meet, then it will be a success. If any of those fail, it will be considered a failure. As you can see from our accuracy rate, um, the accuracy that we measure our system is the number of hits divided by the total of trials done. On the next slide, you'll see that we ran three different tests, uh, three trials each. Now we utilize um, the horizontal, um, uh, horizontal component of our system, testing only the, the left and right uh, circles on the graph um, the, to test the horizontal position. The vertical component of our system is utilized at the top and the bottom of our, uh, of our projection to test the vertical component. Lastly, the full-scale implementation <coughs> utilizes all the circles on the board, as well as the head tracker as well. Now, each, uh, each, T, each T1 and T2 are averaged for each trial for their respective uh, test, and the accuracy rates are also averaged to get a corresponding um, average accuracy for each test. As you can see, the horizontal test is the most accurate of, uh, out of the uh, three, mainly because blinks weren't uh, introduced into the, in the horizontal position. So we have head tracker um, information, we have EOG, and we have this test. And what do the, exactly do these tests uh, tell us about um, the success of the project? So going back to the beginning, we talked about how many people were affected with uh, amputation, upper limb amputations, and we proposed a solution that was the use of the combination of the eye gaze, the, the eye movements, and also the head. The combination of these two was driving a prosthetic arm, or a robot arm in the case that we have. And as we saw that we have around 72% accuracy rate, which means we met our criteria and we are happy for that. And also, I want to mention that after the literature search that we did, um, this is probably the first time that anyone has used the EOG signals to drive prosthetic arms. Lesson learned. Uh, Obviously, we, may, we learn many, many lessons from how to work in groups, how to uh, have plan B and C and D and E and E. <laughs> but the most important uh, lesson that we learned was sometimes the simplest solution is the best solution. Because, uh, for example, we wanted to uh, integrate our devices with each other, and we didn't know which, which method to use. For example, we used the compilers, the combining compilers, or using pipeline method and so far and so forth. And the best method was using a simple data file that made it really efficient for us. This is our man hours and finances. All right, this is the financial and man hour aspect of project. So the most material of this project was provided to us from the bioengineering department. So we had the robotic arm, the bio radio, and the head tractor, which is the most expensive part. <coughs> we also spent money on some other stuff, and about a man hour. Together as a group, we worked for 567 hours, and the rate of dollars per hour came out to be $11,000. So the total, total expense of this project is around $20,000. About work division, well, me and Tony was responsible for mostly for the input project. So the UG signal and the head tracker, what Joe is and Ness is responsible for, for data integration in the robotic arm. But we also work a lot as a group together. And here is our reference, and we are open for questions.